and welcome to Baha'i On Air. I'm Guy Sinclair. And I'm Bev Watson. Baha'i On Air is brought to you by the Baha'is of Auckland to help you learn more about the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith is an independent world religion with millions of adherents worldwide. Some of our major teachings include the oneness of humanity, the inevitability of world peace, the elimination of racial discrimination, and the equality of men and women. Baha'is believe that gender equality is an important prerequisite for world peace. The denial of such equality constitutes an injustice against one half of the world's population. We believe that there are no grounds, moral, practical, or biological, upon which the denial of the equality of men and women can be justified. It is only when women are welcomed into all fields of human endeavour that the moral and psychological climate will be created in which world peace can emerge. One of our Kiwi Baha'i heroes is artist Robin White. Her family life, service to the Baha'i community and excellence in her field provide an inspiring example for women everywhere. Robin tries to do a lot of work with the women in Kiribati introducing the concept of the equality of men and women to them without imposing her own cultural values. Robin herself is a mix of Māori and Pākehā, her father being the first Māori Baha'i in the world. We hope you enjoy these segments from Aaron Tebeku, a portrait of pioneering, featuring New Zealand Baha'i artist Robin White. You are the angels If your feet be firm Robin White, her husband Mike Furukowski, and their eight-year-old son Michael moved to Kiribati, previously known as the Gilbert Islands. Two more of their children, Conrad and Florence, were born there. Several years after the family established their home in this Pacific Island nation of Kiribati, they were visited by a longtime family friend. Anthony Vojkovic. Obviously, these are especially for uh, for Conrad and Florence. The, uh, Ernest Adams, a very fine New Zealand company. Kind of animal. The pandas and the smiling faces. Look at this. Another fine brew of coffee. Mike and Robin were invited by the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of New Zealand to serve as pioneers. And so we got this letter out of the blue saying, would we consider coming to live in Kiribati as New Zealand pioneers because of the possibility of living off Robin's earnings. Now, you know, I don't know whether they had any idea what Robin's earnings had been at the time. They weren't, they weren't sort of excessive by any means. Yeah. But we were pretty young, I mean, early 30s, one oh, child. Very, very young, young very, very young. young yeah. <laughs> we weren't too old anyway. <laughs> we decided, we're still very young. <laughs> we decided to give it a try. We hadn't discussed going pioneering. And I was the one that cleared the, the mailbox that day and there was this letter. And it was such a shock. My first reaction, I must say, was um, <laughs> I burst into tears <laughs> because it was like we were, we'd gone already, and it's, and it was traumatic. You know, to think of leaving New Zealand was uh, was not an easy thought, not for someone. I invested so much in being there and loving the place and celebrating its its beauty and it, the nature of it and, and so on. Came, the day I arrived, it was very, very beautiful, you know, sort of the full sunny day, middle of the morning. It was just such a beautiful looking place. But I was appalled at how little land there was between the ocean and lagoon. There's nowhere on this island where you couldn't hit a golf ball from the lagoon side to the ocean side mm -hmm. if the trees weren't there. I mean, it's that narrow. 
worth for me. I couldn't. I could never hit a golf ball. I couldn't hit a golf ball anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Gilibas straddles both the equator and the international dateline. These Micronesian people have lived for hundreds of years on these small islands, covering two million square miles off Pacific Ocean. The capital is located on the atoll of Tarawa. It is also the home of our pioneer family. Although South Tarawa is very urban, it's still tends to function as a village, far more so obviously on an outer island, but we are still living in what feels like a village. And I, I really have this feeling a village is a very healthy unit to live in. It, it's, a, it, it's a manageable human scale. It seems to fulfil the needs of human beings at every level, material, intellectual, social, cultural. I mean, a city is a, a wonderful buzz, it's exciting and I love going back into the big city and it has much to offer, but there are some things a city doesn't necessarily offer. On that human level of wanting social, warm, <laughs> loving contact with people, which is very nourishing to your soul, to your, to your spirit, and is what keeps you going, what well, keeps me going. <laughs> Feel sorry for people in big cities sometimes. <laughs> In his holy revelation, Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, encouraged the Baha'is to leave their homes and move near or far with the intention of serving his cause. Robin White is one of New Zealand's leading contemporary painters. Sale of her work in New Zealand and Australia helps with the family income. Since living in an extremely different environment, her subjects have changed. Each of the images are of a vertical arrangement rather than a horizontal. I mean, it's much easier to arrange a sort of a narrative kind of image on a horizontal level. I've sort of crowded everything into this vertical arrangement and in a sense that, to me, hopefully conveys something of the kind of the crowded nature of life in Kiribati, where you are thrust, constantly thrust up against human issues. You can't just go off and be a hermit somewhere and, and disassociate yourself from what other people are, are thinking and doing. You're constantly thrust up against what is happening around you at the human level. Robin's earlier New Zealand paintings hang in art galleries and places of prominence in many parts of the country. The bold shapes, colours and subjects had a strong effect on a generation of New Zealanders, often depicting landscapes and faces of friends and families. These are the, ones, the images that perhaps many New Zealanders still remember me by, you know, the, the hills, or the combination of sky, hill and sea, and people who are important to me at that time. With this kind of backdrop, you know, the painting of my mother, Florence and Harbour Cone, which is that's a well-known painting. Images of uh, our first son, Michael. These were sort of the 
the icons that, <laughs> that paid tribute to, to, to the land and put me at that time, I suppose, into what art writers might at that time have called, and perhaps some of them still do, refer to as a, as a regionalist school, if you like. The local people call themselves Ikiribans. They are deeply religious, and the Baha'i principle of the oneness of religion helps reconcile traditional and Christian beliefs. Christianity came here in the uh, middle part of the 19th century. Kiribati is particularly blessed in this sense. Hiram Bingham was the uh, Protestant missionary who came here. Now Hiram Bingham was really a scholar. I mean he wasn't an evangelist. And when you read the accounts of his arrival here and what he did, there were very, very few converts in his time here. But what he did was he translated the Bible, the entire Bible, and it was an extraordinary thing to do, into Gilbertese language. Well, there was no written form of the language of Kiribas prior to the arrival of Hiram Bingham. I think he, he made a great contribution to preserving the Kiribas language in the form that it was spoken at that time. Pingen and a team of Igiripas translators paved the way for the Baha'i faith. Most Igiripas, if not all Igiripas that I know who have become Baha'is, have become Baha'is for one reason, and that is because they read their Bible. As Christians, they have, they are, if they're Protestants anyway, they are aware of the Bible. And then, having met up with the Baha'i faith, they have investigated Baha'u'llah's claims to be the fulfillment of certain prophecies in the Bible, and decided that this is the truth. And their decision be to become Baha'is is on that basis, that Baha'u'llah fulfills prophecies spoken of in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It is not a denial of Christianity, it's a fulfillment. It's taking a step which is required for, of you as a Christian. You're really fulfilling your obligations to Christ where, when he said, you know, watch and wait, I will return. Baha'is believe that God sent many teachers at different times to bring humankind added knowledge as we matured. The thing to do then is to start introducing new Baha'is to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. We have a, a Baha'i administrative system and how that functions and what their role is in that. Because everybody's involved, because in the Baha'i faith there is no clergy. Baha'u'llah is saying to humanity, you've grown up. Here are some basic facts about the Baha'i faith. Baha'is believe there are many names for God, but there is only one God, neither male nor female, nor a physical being. God created us through the process of evolution and gave us spiritual qualities and the power to know and understand. Baha'is believe that God has sent prophets to all the peoples of the earth who are animated by the same Holy Spirit. They all reveal the word of God and teach the same faith. Race unity is the belief that we are all children of God and that we can love each other as one family. The central purpose of the Baha'i faith is to establish the unity of the human race. The Baha'i community is more than 150 years old and has more than 5 million believers in 300 nations. The Baha'i faith has been established in countries throughout the world as an independent religion based on Holy Scripture. Das has one of the highest concentration of Baha'is in the world. 
you will have seen that there's a number of coconut trees which are referred to as toddy trees right next to our house. This means that these are trees that have been specifically uh, chosen as the trees from which the sap is collected every morning and every night. While he's up there doing, doing all that, he's singing. The other morning we heard um, a very beautiful song that's just been written, which talks about the time when Baha'u'llah was in the Siakal, the, the, the prison in Tehran. It's a very beautiful song. It touches the heart. It's in the song, Baha'u'llah says, don't let my son come and visit me here and see me in this condition. His young son wanted to see him. When I finished with university and teacher training college, I decided to look for work in television. And I worked in children's television in Dunedin for seven years. Worked on some other programs as well, some quizzes, um, a home handyman show for six months. And it was in 1982, or at the end of 81, that we got the invitation to consider going pioneering, and I was quite Let's say I wasn't displeased to consider abandoning my career. <laughs> yeah, but I, I didn't have much going for my, you know, my career didn't have much going for it in television. As foreigners, life here for the family has presented its challenges, especially for Mike. Because of limited employment opportunities, he has not had steady work. Teaching high school had provided occasional temporary employment. I did what I could to, to earn a supplementary income, including one of the most disgusting jobs I've ever had in my life, and I've had lots and lots of jobs, but exporting eel guts to Hawaii was <laughs> one of the worst. It was quite lucrative. I'm not a missionary. I'm an ordinary Baha'i doing here what I do in Dunedin. I'm not going to go around telling people what to do and you know, how to run the Baha'i community. It's a, it's a learning experience that we're all sharing together, finding out by you know, deepening our understanding of the writings and applying the, the principles to the Baha'i community. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I've had to make what I would consider sacrifices. I've learnt so much here that I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn. I certainly couldn't imagine myself being in a position to learn in New Zealand. Oh my God, oh my God. Unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavor. Many of the writings have been translated into Gilbertese. We can seek guidance from those writings. Also, we have a Baha'i community. The intention there is to provide a, a loving, closely knit community which also provides a source of comfort, of um, encouragement and inspiration to individuals. Through the um, interaction of, of you know, the friendship that develops in a Baha'i community at a personal level, the observance of holy days, through other gatherings which are organised by the local spiritual assembly or the local committees, such as the, the women's conference that we've just had, 
Robin and Mike's oldest son is working and studying in New Zealand. Robin doesn't hesitate to express what she misses most about living in Kiribati. Our son. Yeah, of course. Sure. And the, the fact that we, our immediate family is not all together. You know, we have three children, two are here and one is in New Zealand. One of the two children here may very soon be going back to New Zealand. My 
My name is Onsens. Paula says, the world of humanity is like a garden. All the races are the flowers, which constitute its adornment and decoration. It's a paradox. Human beings from such different cultural and racial and religious backgrounds can have so much in common. You know, the basic urges and drives, and the need for love, the need for acceptance, you know is there in any human being and at the same time that we can be so profoundly different and I find that very interesting <laughs> obviously the need is for us to understand and certainly accept the profound similarities that we have and at the same time to respect and understand our differences and to celebrate those differences really but if you haven't done if you haven't experienced that degree of difference, it can be very unsettling, unsettling, it's disorienting at first. And you wonder, where am I? What are these people thinking? What are they doing? You know, why are they doing this? <laughs> You've been watching Baha'i On Air. Today's program featured video highlights from the documentary Arun Tebeku, a portrait of pioneering about New Zealand Baha'i artist Robin White. Robin seemed to overcome her life challenges with such grace and spirituality. Yes, and, and her love for the people of Kiribati really shows in her work. I was interested too to see how she draws inspiration for her work from the Baha'i writings. Hmm. Next time on Baha'i On Air, we will feature more about Robin White and Kiribati. If you would like to know more about the Baha'i faith or our teachings on the equality of men and women, please call us on 0800 224247 or 0800-BAHAIS. And remember to tune in next time to Baha'i On Air. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. See you.